Frogbit Blog. Hello and welcome to episode 57 of the Frogbit Blog podcast. And um, We've got Mark, who's just about to head off around the world to do some good eco things. It's our last farewell from him before he starts reporting from exotic locations. You'll be glad to hear that Sexy Len is back again. And um, We've got usual stuff on the climate and we've got uh, gangster gardening amongst all the other usual features. So why don't you just listen up and shut up and get on with it? No, that's me. I've got to shut up and get on with it, haven't I? Right, well, I've just found out that the last episode, but one called Orchids Are Bastards, and wasn't working for anyone to hear. I had to re upload it and it's been fixed now. So if you want to listen, and believe me, you should, because it's hilarious. It's quite possibly the best episode I've ever done. Now, seriously, though, you can listen back to Orchids Are Bastards now. Um, so what's been in the news? I think the most distressing story is the Amazon being on fire. You know, the Amazon, lungs of the earth being destroyed with the tacit approval of Mr. Bolsonaro. Um, I really can't talk too much about this because it's so upsetting. And I know I try and keep this podcast positive as possible, but bloody hell, it's hard going sometimes, isn't it? Um, and there is talk I've read on Facebook and go around that the Amazon fires, oh, it's no different than any other year, as if that somehow makes it out. Okay, um, but I read a letter today from a Brazilian MP who says that NASA satellite research um, shows that the fires are up by 75% on last year. Is there a more dangerous man on the planet right now than Bolsonaro, um, apart from Trump? <laughs> well, there is one less dangerous man on the planet. Charles Cock has died. Yep, there's now one less cock in the world, which can only be a good thing, can't it, listeners? One of the richest men on the planet. And um, what does he choose to do with his money? He could solve the climate change problem, couldn't he? He could solve world hunger. He could solve cancer. He could solve age. You know, the sort of things that any decent human being might do with lots of money. But nope, what he did, he funded a lot of the climate denial stuff. He funded a lot of right-wing anti-democracy stuff. And he made the world a meaner, spirited place. Now, I do realise, you know, if I said, ah, fuck him and was all clever, that it would just show me up to be mean-spirited as he is, and I'm not going to stoop so low. So what I think we should do is just let's have a few seconds silence to ponder the death of another fellow human being. Now, it's been birthday weekend here in the Frogbit household because both me and Mary, we share the same birthday. Um, So it's happy birthday to us, happy birthday to us. Now, we don't normally do presents, but this year we decided to spend a fiver on something useful in the local shop in the village. And I got Mary a nice pasta bowl because she loves pasta. And she got me some lovely vegan ice cream. Now, bear in mind, listeners, right, it was a £5 limit so when she bought me the vegan ice cream I went on the website to check vegan ice cream £4.80 yeah £4.80 the fucking cheapskate £4.80 bloody anyway we had a huge row it spoiled the day for both of us and we won't be doing that again you know what I mean she had £5 to spend and she only spent £4.80 and see what happens when you inject mindless consumerism and you see what mindless consumerism does to people so we won't be buying each other presents again Now, not only is it our birthday, but it's our chicken anniversary. Yep, it's a year to the day since we owned four eggs battery hens. Yep, Minnie, Flossie, Moira and June. And very happy they are too. They've got about 50 square metres of allotment to run about in. And at night, they're stuck in this protected run that's about three metres by three metres. And in fenced fenced in on the top too with chicken wire, which is probably why they call it chicken wire. It never occurred to me before, but it's chicken wire because it protects chickens. Yeah. Um, so a few things I've noticed about keeping chickens, which if you if you don't keep them, you might want to hear these little words of wisdom. Um, if you give them a lot of space, they sort of revert to some of their instinctive wild habits. So remember, these chickens are descended from jungle fowl. So they like scratching around in the dirt and soil. And they also like digging a little hole to sit in and sunbathe. It's wonderful to see. And they also like laying their eggs in the bushes and not in the coop. 
And they've got a little coop, yeah, a little hut, and it, they have a little cubicle each where they sleep on a bed of sawdust. Now, what surprised me about chickens is that they poo the bed, yeah, constantly have to clean the poo out the beds. And I was thinking that's a bit weird of an instinctive behaviour to have, isn't it? thing to do is to be constantly shitting in your bed, doesn't it? And I tried to work out why they do that, and I realised what it was was in their wild state, they would sleep up in branches, and they would just poo off a branch onto the ground, no harm done. Well, unless you happen to be walking underneath. But we get them to sleep in these coops or stalls so that they lay their eggs in there and they must get used to pooing in their stalls. Anyway, mystery solved, eh? The frog did blow. Right, so um, Greta Thunberg's now a good way across the Atlantic on the solar-powered boat. Um, now, I know we shouldn't put the responsibility on the shoulders of one so young, but what an incredible character she is. Because I, I listen to her and everything she says is just so spot on. Um, saying it's not about her, it's about the science, believe in the science. Um, I'm very impressed with her, but let's not try and put too much um, pressure on her, eh? Um, and after last week's episode, which was called Who's Afraid of Greta Thunberg, where I talked about some of the criticism she was getting, lo and behold, there was a new outrageous batch of criticism towards her. You know, that fine, upstanding fellow Adam Banks tweeted, Free yachting accidents do happen in August. And then accused us all of lacking humour that we didn't find a joke about a 16-year-old girl drowning. Very funny. And I'd just like to say to add on, um, Banks, Carol Cad Cadwallader has got your number. Um, check out Carol Cadwallader's stuff on TED Talks and what she's saying about Brexit and dark money and Aaron Banks and that sort of stuff. And yes, Mr. Banks is involved and he's actually trying to sue Carol Cadwallader to shut her up and tie her up in litigation for a long time. Anyone, um, he, he's not the only one complaining about Greta. Um, Greta. There's some double barreled upper class nomad called Julia Hardly. Bower and she said, Hi Greta, I've just booked some long haul flights for my family to enjoy some winter sun on the beach this Christmas. Level of guilt being felt naught percent. I mean, really, how old are you? Um, it's true, isn't it? The kids are sounding like adults and the adults are sounding like children. What, what on earth is going on? Is it okay? Talk about drugs. Is it okay? Gonna do it anyway. Is it okay to talk about drugs? Is it okay? Right, is it okay? There's a couple of stories this week about the medical use of medical medical use of things that in the past have been used mainly to get you off your face. Um, firstly, MDMA. Um, and as the results of a study have come through about using MDMA to treat alcohol addiction, and it seems to work. It's probably because you're too busy dancing and gurning to have time to drink. No, no, seriously, seriously, Mr. Frogbeer, you must treat this issue with the seriousness it requires. And this is what it says. Doctors in Bristol are testing whether a few doses of the drug in conduction with psychotherapy Oh, right, you've got to talk to a doctor while you're on drugs. Great. No. In conjunction with psychotherapy could help patients overcome alcoholism more effectively than conventional treatments. Those who have completed the study have so far reported almost no relapse and no physical or psychological problems. In comparison, 8 in 10 alcoholics in England relapse within three years after current treatment approaches. Dr. Ben Sasser, an addiction psychiatrist and senior research fellow at Imperial College in London, who led the trial, said, With the very best that medical science can work, with 80% of people are drinking within three years post-alcohol detox. 11 people so far have completed the safety and tolerability study, which involves nine months of follow-ups. We've got one person who has completely relapsed back to previous drinking levels. We have five people who are completely dry, and we have four or five who have one or two drinks but wouldn't reach the diagnosis of alcohol use disorder, Sessa said. Now, listen on. I think you can tell this fellow used to have a dabble. After the MDMA assisted sessions, patients stay overnight and are telephoned every day for a week to collect data on sleep quality, mood and potential suicide risk. 
Significantly, this data has shown no evidence of drug withdrawal or come down symptoms from the MDMA. There is no Black Monday, Black Tuesday or whatever ravers call it. You mean whatever you used to call it, Ben. In my opinion, this is an artifact of raving. It's not about MDMA, says Ben Sessa, referring to rec recreational users of the drug, which is often associated with clubbing. If there was a craze of people going around abusing cancer chemotherapy drugs, you wouldn't think, oh, well, it's not safe to take cancer chemotherapy when doctors give it to you, says Sessa. Scientists know it's not dangerous. The Sun newspaper thinks it's dangerous because a tiny number of fatalities that occur every year all get on their front page. Okay to talk about drugs. Is it okay? Gonna do it anyway. Yeah, it's Lamb again. It's sexy Lamb again. Ooh, yeah, it's Lamb again. Oh, yeah, it's Lamb again. Lamb. Right then, um, after a lengthy absence, of, oh, it feels like for, forever, <laughs> and he's come back and he's all tanned and everything. It's as, sexy as Lamb. <laughs> he's back again. So, how are you doing, your man? What's up? What news have you got it's for been us? What's busy. happened with your summer? Uh, it's busy. Been busy summer, yeah. I've enjoyed lots of sunshine, yeah. um, as I'm sure you have as well, mm. and uh, sort of getting a bit fitter, which was nice. Uh, I managed to sell my house, which is good. All right. I've been trying so, to do that for a while. And where you're um, moving to the. To, Coast, are you? Yeah, beachiness, yes. So we're going to take up a rental in a beachy area, and uh, it's thankfully closer to the potential allotment that's coming up. Very nice. <gasps> An yeah. allotment. Indeed. So I've, not, I've found, finally found out I'm about in the low 20s now uh, in regard to on, being on the list. Started off in the hundreds, so uh -huh. it's literally a matter of months away, uh, right. if not weeks. So they've got new management at the allotment site, and hopefully they're going to be whittling their way down it, and I'm going to be picking up that allotment key very yeah, soon. Yeah, and you said you're going to pick my brains, aren't you? Yeah, a little I bit, am. yeah. Probably yeah. the worst allotment <laughs> keeper in the world, um, mainly because I'm a you know I'm so you know after reading all this stuff about um, plants having feelings and stuff is that I just hate <laughs> actually I just constantly apologise oh sorry pulling them up wow. because most of the things that grow in my allotment because it, it, it's next to the woods and it's obviously used to be wild yeah it's just wild flowers grow yeah you know yeah. in the beds and stuff so I'm really low to pick them up so what I do is I tend to pick them up and move them somewhere else sort of mm -hmm. thing but. Uh, no, there's a whole system to to, yeah. to allotment keeping, and I've not quite got it because our allotments, because they're next to the woods, they only get about three or four hours sun. Indeed. So there's only certain things you can grow. But one of the things I um, found that you can grow is cucumbers in Very the good. greenhouse. Yes. Have you ever seen a cucumber, a real cucumber? I haven't, no. They're nothing like, <laughs> you know, cucumbers, long, yeah. thin, green things. And the proper homegrown cucumbers are shorter and knobblier and a bit spiky. Um, kind of like courgette <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very courgette, yeah. and you, you peel them because the, the, these ones, the, the skins are a bit tough, but they taste like completely different. Than Very them. nice. Yeah, I so, mean, it's also the potential is that it's like I've got absolutely no idea what's going to be present on the site when I go into it. It could be very well maintained. It could have absolutely no structures on it. It could have a shed on it. It could have a conservatory on it. Not conservatory. Yeah, um, would you just know a, a greenhouse? A greenhouse. On it. The conservatory, <laughs> conservatory would be asking a lot. Wouldn't yeah. it? <laughs> Can I have an allotment with the conservatory and the sea view, please? I'll be waiting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, so you're not sure what to go. I suppose it depends on the soil and the sun, doesn't yeah. it? But there is a system, isn't it? Isn't this is much I know, is there a system where certain things you plant after each other because they put stuff back into the yeah. soil. So, for example, beans come after peas, like legumes or something like that. Very good. Stuff like that. I've just, with my beds, I've just actually, because um, apparently you're not meant to plant the same things in the same beds year after year because they oh, right, attract okay. bugs, but also it... Use up um, uses up the nutrients in the mm -hmm. soil. Um, so I've actually with my beds, I'm just um, planting them with green manure, uh -huh. which is like white clover and stuff like that. And then yeah. you dig that in, and it, it gives the beds, you know, a chance to regenerate. That's good and, advice and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Because I've noticed that because one thing that does grow early on is um, peas and monge too and stuff like uh -huh. that. But they've been getting worse and worse for the past two or three years. The the, the harvest has not been uh -huh. as good. So I thought I'm going to try something different. Mm -hmm. But what I have been trying because it, my allotments quite big and I've got chickens in there the, the one uh -huh. thing that the chickens won't eat is nettles and I've yeah. got lots of nettles and I've read you can make your own um, 
liquid fertilizer uh-huh. and nettles. So that's what I've done, and I've cut all the nettles up now. They've flowered yeah. and put them in buckets, and you put a lid on and leave them about two months, and it friggin' stinks. <laughs> it does, and then you take the lid off, sieve all the liquid out, yeah. and then put it into bottles, and it's really, um, oh. really good stuff. There you go for for greening. Um, if you want stuff for fruit to improve fruiting, borage is meant to be a good one. So I'm uh-huh. growing that next year, and that's actually got um, something. Is it potassium in it or something? Something uh-huh. extra that will give you more fruit with no so, chemicals and all that. No stuff. chemicals. So that's yeah. what I'm going for. I'm trying to actually create, you know, a, a permaculture type thing. Uh-huh. Um, and I've been saving a lot of the stuff that I've cut, the rough stuff that wouldn't actually be very good for manure. Yeah. I'm saving it for um, the stuff that you put around the plants. What's it called? Where you put it around, I've forgotten. You the know word. more than me. I know more than you, and I've completely <laughs> forgotten. Mulching, that's very it. good, very good. Yeah, because yes, yes. you put if you mulch around the plants, uh-huh. then it um, stops weeds growing through and mm. it, it retains moisture. Because I've been watching these um, YouTube videos about how to grow a forest in ten years. Have yes. you seen these? No, no, They're no. Quite fascinating that you can grow a forest much quicker. If you follow these things, like you dig up the soil and so it's not compacted uh-huh. and then you plant the trees and then you mulch them wow. really deep in, in mulch to cover yeah. sort of thing that stops any weeds going through wow. and, you know, and, and you feed them and within 10 years you get a fully grown forest sort of thing. Mm. So I'm trying that. Very good. I mean, it, the allotment that I'm going for, so we're pretty well established. It does have fruit trees and things in it, um, in the in some of them, obviously not all of them. Um, I'm just looking forward to the community aspect of it as well. It's yeah. going to be good. I mean, they do have like a centralised shop where you can rent like um, a rotavator out and things like that, which is quite good. Yeah. Instead of having to buy your own, which is again a, a fantastic sort of on the minimalism side of things. is great. It's like a library of yeah. tool, tools that you just get it when you need it instead of everybody having one. That's perfect. And it's great. Isn't I love it? that. Yeah. I love that about it. Cool. So what do you fancy? What veg do you fancy? I don't know. I eat a lot. Well, to be honest, we probably need a lot of greenhouse coverage because our family tend to eat a lot of things like uh, tomatoes and uh, uh, chilies, things yeah. like that. Loads of them. Yeah, chilies uh, grow well. That's one thing that yeah. does grow well in our greenhouse, chilies. So really? Right with that, but you end up. It's like anything; you get a glut of them. So we yeah. actually, the past couple of years, we've actually um, put them in. You know, shove what's it? Sort of boil them up and Very preserve good. them as sort of like jam, chilies. Yeah. Almost, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking I freeze quite a lot of them, uh, and we tend to just chop them up frozen in the pasta and stuff. Nice, and, and it's a good way of doing. Yeah, it. Oh, you, you can actually sort of dip the frozen chili itself into the pasta water, and that defrosts it very slightly, just dead quick, and then you can just chop it up and straight in the fryer. Good lad. So there you go. Man. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm trying. Yeah, brilliant. A lot of exciting. <laughs> so what else? You're minimalising your wardrobe. Oh, you that's it, that's a, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, again, sort of for those who haven't listened to the podcast in a while, it's like I started off coming onto it sort of talking about minimalism and things um and there's a few things i've been following with regard to the minimalist wardrobe mm-hmm. again the, the main aspects of that is going to be buying very high, researching very high quality items uh and buying a lot less of them so um i've been trying to think about going down the route of like having basically like a uniform uh, there's a few minimalists that are famous on the internet for this uh like those who invent like the 33 rule which is having 33 items of clothing that you then wear in different rotations does that include knickers and socks it does you know bloody yeah. hell I know I know uh, and also one sock one item or is it a pair of it's socks it's a pair it's oh, a right, pair that's yes. okay. there is certain rules to it and there's right. certain articles you can look at on the internet there as well uh, there's certain famous minimalists who've wrote about it uh, like Josh Becker and things like that you can give a quick google to um, but yeah I've kind of like sort of um, tried to do it for comfort um, style and affordability but also quality as well and obviously that's better for the environment isn't it yeah oh completely um, so I'm still working on that uh, and there's a few sort of sort of twists and turns I'm going to be going down but yeah just a nice pair of jeans a really nice high quality t-shirt and um, followed up with a barber jacket or a suit jacket depending on if you want to sort of smarten oh, up a nice. little bit and, and the other thing uh, is as well is that not having to buy it new because I know Mary's got a new mm. job three days a week where she's working with a rather um, refined posh old lady yeah. so she has to dress up a bit and she's uh-huh. been going to um, all the second-hand shops, uh-huh. and she's getting some really, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, stuff that would be hundred quid, and uh-huh. she's getting for a quid or two. I mean, yeah. why bother buying it new? Because yeah. people, people tend to wear it once, don't they? Uh-huh. And there is a big move, isn't there, about um, making fashion more sustainable? Mm-hmm. I know there's some companies now are actually trying to trying to do that, and I think mm-hmm. it's important because it sounds like the amount of waste there is in fashion. It's incredible. incredible. I mean, there used to be uh, some of the famous sort of minimalist things I've read about in regard to fashion and fast fashion, as they tend to call it, is that it talks about cycles of, uh, of of fashion and seasons. Yeah. So it used to be that um, sort of going back to the 40s and 50s, it used to be like two seasons. You got hot and cold. Yeah. And then they started building into more seasons, so you got like the, the building into maybe 12 seasons. Now we're moving the cycles of 52 
um, a year. So it's like literally on a weekly basis, you're going to get a new cycles. Uh, and that means that the, the shops have to have a new close in there every single week. And that means that a lot of the shops are going through awful practices, like obviously not even making the clothes is, is awful in itself a lot of the time, uh, but also cutting them up and then putting them in bin bags and uh, bin and everything. Not and even week. giving them away. Not even giving them away. Why wouldn't they do that? Is it some big... It, well, because it'd be probably impacting on the business, I guess. Um, I can only imagine, but it sounds... Yeah, because then awful. everyone would just wait a week and go to the yeah, second-hand yeah, yeah, yeah. clothes shop. And that would, that would spoil the, the sort of cycle of massive consumption, I guess. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, well, we rattled. We we'll get through it really quickly, don't <laughs> we? We do, I know. Well, I enjoy it. Though. Yes, well, thank you very much for coming in and hopefully we won't leave it as long next time. I would like we're both back at work now and it's full on now, <laughs> isn't it? Till it is. next spring before we can take a breath. I feel paler already. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Thanks for coming in, then. <laughs> thank you. It's land again, land, ooh, land, ooh, sexy land, ooh, land. Nature is clever, it's really, really clever. Nature is clever, it's really, really clever. Nature ain't a Tory, nature ain't a Trump. That's not saying much because they're really, really dumb. Oh, nature is clever. Right, Nature is clever. Um, I finally got into audiobooks because um, I've started listening to podcasts in bed to help me get to sleep. So I thought, oh, I may as well try audiobooks because when I read real books in bed, I'm usually fast asleep by the end of the first page. So the first audiobook I'm reading is Incredible Journeys Exploring the Wonders of Animal Navigation by David Barn. And it's a fascinating book about how animals are really, really clever and use so many different senses to navigate smell, sight, electric fields, magnetic fields, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, it's a great read and I'd fully recommend it if you're into the, if that's your thang. Anyway, he talks about Clark's Nutcracker, which I've heard of before about before, but I thought I'd revisit. Um, Clark, as in Lewis and Clark, you know, the American explorers were one of the first to head west and work out how much land could be stolen off the native uh, population. But anyway, Clark's Nutcrackers are really, really clever because of their ability to remember um, where most of the nuts that they buried are buried. Buried. Now, interestingly, they don't have to remember where they're all buried because to have a perfect memory would require enormous amounts of brain power. And having a bigger brain requires even more food because brains require a lot of energy. So their brains are big enough and clever enough to remember where most of the things they are hidden most of the nuts are hidden. And here's what they do. Clark's nutcrackers are experts at difficult art of freeing seeds from pine cones. Each cone contains dozens of seeds which are inaccessible to most animals until autumn when the cones open and spread their protective scales. But nutcrackers don't have to wait. No, they don't. As stiff, unripe cones become available each July, they jab their strong piercing bills between the scales to loosen and tear out bits of seeds and they store tens of thousands of them. After a nut, Clark's nutcracker eats its fill of pine seeds, it stores the rest upwards of 100 pine seeds at a time in an expandable pocket below its tongue. Ooh, that's handy. The bird then flies around the forest, burying clusters of four or five seeds in the soil. During peak pine cone season, it will cache up to 500 seeds per hour. By the end of the fall, each nutcracker has stashed tens of thousands of seeds a food source it relies on through the winter. Um, and they are able to relocate caches of seeds with remarkable accuracy even nine months later. Um, even when the cache of sites are buried in up to three foot of snow. Um, how clever are they? And remember, they are um, members of the, they're a member of the COVID family. And as we know on this show, COVIDs are really, really clever. In fact, we could say that. But nature is clever. Right, 
Right, Mother Earth, her name is Gaia, and her temperature has been getting higher, hasn't it, this summer with record temperatures? Um, and there's been um, Extinction Rebellion protesters in court recently from last April, the stuff that happened last April, and some interesting stuff has come out from this, and this is what it says. A senior Scotland Yard officer giving evidence at the first group trial of Extinction Rebellion activists behind mass protest in central London said the demonstrators had provoked soul-searching and pr proved articulate, more articulate than me, and proved articulate and rational as they made their case. The protests in April this year had found support even among public facing severe disruption from the demonstrations, he said. And funnily enough, I did read a few weeks ago where some police were frustrated that it was all so peaceful and nice because they couldn't really wade in and do much. Um, they said it'd been easier had they been violent because they could have um, waded in. So bear that in mind, good people. And it's also great that a mainstream politician came out in support of the protest too. Um, the trial at the City of London Magistrates Court heard a statement from John McDonnell um, who said the mass protests in central London led directly to MPs debating and declaring a formal climate and environment emergency. The Shadow Chancellor said he and others had been inspired by the action taken by Extinction Rebellion in April when sections of central London were shut down for days and that the Labour Party's policy programme had developed quickly and substantially as a result. The activists successfully raised the profile of the climate threat and focused the minds of all of us on the radical action that is needed, he said in a statement read out in court. Um, so the protesters were fined and had to promise to stay out of trouble. Um, great stuff. And um, Meanwhile, over in America, some of the more enlightened Democratic presidential hopefuls have been talking about their climate change plans. And the most ambitious to date has been Bernie Sanders and his plan. And this is what it says. Calling the global climate crisis both the greatest threat facing the U.S. and the greatest opportunity tra for transformative change Senator Bernie Sanders unveiled today a comprehensive Green New Deal proposed that would transition the US economy to 100% renewable energy and create 20 million well-paying jobs over a decade. This is a pivotal moment in the history of America and really in the history of humanity, Sanders, a 2020 Democratic presidential candidate, said in the statement. When we are in the White House, we will launch the decade of the Green New Deal, a 10-year mobile to avert climate catastrophe during which climate change, justice and equity will be factored into virtually every area of policy, from immigration to trade to foreign policy and beyond. And this is great because even now some of the Republicans are making tentative steps towards embracing and phasing the problem. For example, it, there's an article that says Republicans are beginning to feel the heat on climate change. <laughs> See what they did there? Heat, climate change. Yeah. Anyway, Though a significant block of the party continued to deny the basic science of the issue, some senior Republicans are showing willingness to consider incremental legislation to, to, to turbocharge clean energy funding, uh, invest in greening buildings, support electric vehicle charging infrastructure and promote energy efficiency. And a few others are going further, notably Rep um, Representative Francis Rooney, who supports a carbon tax, an idea that hasn't attracted Republican support since a failed cap and trade bill nearly a decade ago. I don't understand what it is about people in politics that they seem to be immune from some of these large shifts opinions out there in the real world. Well, it's probably the money they're all getting, isn't it, from uh, the fossil fuel industry? I mean, almost all the large company CEOs are for taking reasonable steps to deal with climate change and sea level rise, said Rooney, who represents a, close, a, a coastal Florida district and served as an ambassador in the George W. Bush administration. Now, I, I said the other week, I've been watching, um, I've got Netflix um, and I've been watching loads of stuff recently and a couple of really good documentaries I've been watching. And the first was a series on Vietnam and the second one that I've just watched was a World War II documentary series from the American perspective and it was quite an eye-opener because I didn't realise this. America um, had a very small army going into World War II, just somewhere just over 100,000 men and they didn't have much military infrastructure at all. And as soon as a Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor Harbor, the Yanks realized they had to get their shit together. And virtually within weeks, the whole of American industry was turned over to the war effort. And it was quite an incredible feat. 
as they realize the existential threat, their existence from fascism. Now, if they can virtually overnight do that about fascism, surely they can do the same about the next and the biggest existential threat of climate change. It's all doable, isn't it? It's just It just needs public pressure to force them to move in this direction. Um, it's doable. So they've just got to keep being pushed. So we've got to keep pushing in any way and every way we can. And I think I'll leave it there for now. Rich people doing good eco things. Rich people doing good eco things. Rich people doing good eco things. Right, rich people doing good eco things this week. We've got Leonardo back on the show. He's been on a few times, hasn't he? Because he's talked about giving um, loads of money to fight climate change. Leonardo DiCaprio here, obviously, yeah. He was on um, when there was a beetle named after him in an episode I had called I Want to Hold Your Antennae. And then he was on promoting his eco shoes. He's done a few songs, actually, and they're a bit rubbish, to be honest. And then he was on again doing his eco song with Little Nobby. Um, now, if you've listened before, you remember that he pretends to be Irish, all because he's trying to win Kate Winslet back after he played the Irish fella Jack in Titanic. And I think he's gone a bit mental and he's stuck with the accent. Anyway, he's back in the news because he's got a new film out, yeah, an eco film. Um, so I'm going to give him a call and find out a bit more about it. Oh, it's ringing. Well, hello, Leonard speaking. Leonard? Um, I must have got the wrong number. No, you daft fecker. I've changed my name by deed poll to Leonard. Leonard O. DiCaprio. I thought it had a little more Irish ring to it. <laughs> He's still trying to get Kate back. Look, I'm making good progress, though the restraining order hasn't helped. Anyway, what the feck do you want? Um, I wanted to talk about your new film, your new eco film that you've done. Um, is it anything like The Revenant? Oh, don't talk to me about The Revenant. It was feckin' freezing, and there was me thinking it was about an English vicar. Uh, yeah, you told us that, Joe. Last time, um, the word is reverend, not revenant. Well, I know that now, but I'm Catholic. Aren't reverends different, you know, like Catholic priests, only without the child abuse? Um, yeah, something like that. Um, anyway, Leonard, Leonard, tell us about your new film, will you? Well, it's called Ice on Fire. Oh, yeah, quick, call the fire brigade. No, I said ice on fire, sacky fecker. Anyway, science tells us that our current climate crisis is a problem we've created, but it is also a problem we can fix. And DeFer explains that in order to stop climate change, not only do we need to reduce our carbon emissions, but we also have to do something about the carbon dioxide that we've already released. So in addition to exploring the potential impact of solar energy, wind energy and tidal energy, the dock offers up the other half of the solution, the process of pulling carbon and dioxide out of the atmosphere and oceans and sequestering it into underground or into new materials. My partners and I have made ice on fire to give a voice to the scientists and the researchers who work tirelessly every day on the front line of the climate change. You know, we wanted to make a film that depicts the beauty of our planet while highlighting much needed solutions across renewable energy and carbon sequestration. You know, the film does more than show what is at stake if we continue on a course of inaction and complacency. It shows how, with the help of dedicated scientists, we can all fight back. I hope the audiences will be inspired to take action and to protect our beautiful planet. Bloody hell, Leo. I'm sorry, Leonard. Uh, that's great. You don't half make an effort, do you? Is um, Kate impressed? Well, apart from the restraining order, I think I'm wearing it down with all my acts of kindness. Well, I do hope it works out for you. Um, thanks, Mr. Frogbit. Bye now. Bye. <laughs> what a thoroughly decent chap that Leonard O. DiCaprio is, eh? It's not where you're from, it's where you're at. And you can't help it if you're a posh rich twat. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, won't somebody please think of the flowers? You know that they have feelings just like ours, so what do we do? Um, we eat them then, don't we? Can you hear them scream? I'm talking about growing and murdering vegetables. Um, did you know gardening is gangster? Gardening is gangster, I should say, yeah. And I've just read an article on a website called pharmacy.com. That's pharmacy, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, as in farm, where you grow things, farm, pharmacy, get it or forget it. Anyway, the title of the article is why growing food is the single most impactful thing you can do in a corrupt political system but it's in america so i should have done that in american accent um i did actually mention community garden in florida in the last episode anyway let's have a brief look at what it says it has become much more of a meaningful political statement than supporting political parties and candidates the most effective change makers in our society aren't waiting around for a new president to make their lives better. They're planting seeds, quite literally, and through the revolutionary act of gardening, they're rebuilding their communities while growing their own independence. Every four years when the big election comes round, millions of people put their passion for creating a better world into an increasingly corrupt and absurd political contest. What if the energy was instead invested in something worthwhile, something that directly and immediately improved life, community and world at large? The simple act of growing our own food directly challenges the control matrix in many authentic ways, which is why some of the most forward-thinking and strongest-willed people are picking up shovels and defiantly starting gardens. Yeah, defiant garden. I like the sound of that. I'm defiantly growing cucumbers this year in our... Well, I'm definitely growing cucumbers. I don't know about the defiant... Definitely defiant. Anyway... Back to the article, propaganda gardening, which is a combination of guerrilla gardening and political protest, is about developing self-sufficiently while making a simple yet bold statement about the world we all share and the rules we choose to live by. Take, for example, Ron Finley, the guerrilla gardener, in inverted commas, from Los Angeles, who inspires the world with no-nonsense truth about how corporate food system enslaves us. While, provide, while proving to us that the most effective weapon in this fight is fertile soil. He makes growing veggies cool again, as it should be, because food sovereignty is the very foundation of personal independence. And this is what Ron says on the matter. I live in a food prison. What's a food prison, Ron? Is that where you're locked away for 24 hours a day in a celery <laughs> with broccoli bars and horseradish handcuffs? And I added it, by the way. No, it's all by design, just like prisons are by design. I just get tired of being an inmate. So I figured, let me change this paradigm. Let me grow my own food. This is one thing I can do to escape this predestined life that I have unwittingly suspended to. That's good, isn't it? And think about it. Creating your own food supply challenges the status quo in a number of important ways. Okay. It decreases dependence on polluted corporate food system. It improves health and wellness by providing exercise and nutritious food, freeing us from dependence on a for-profit medical system. And it undermines Monsanto boo, and the agro agrochemical industry that is polluting our world and killing bees. It highlights issues of political control by pitting homeowners and gardeners against government and ordinance makers. And it builds and heals community by, by providing a place and activity worth coming together over. And it works to repair the damage we are doing to the environment with our consumer lifestyles. It protects us against insecurity and food unrest. And it protects a greater awakening by setting an example for others to follow. Um, and I read this article, and at the bottom of the article is a music um, video called Gardening is Gangster by Master Mark and Sifu Paul Davis. Sifu Paul Davis, and it's had 40, um, 44,000 views, so it's well known. Um, and I'll play a few seconds of it for a minute for you. And as this is a rap hip-hop song, I was wondering if there's going to be ironic lines about digging with my hoe and stuff like that. So have a listen, yeah. Gangster, gangster. 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 Gangster.
watch rivals my Sancho. I'm searching for the city of gold like El Dorado. But you ain't gon' find it living in no city condo. So it's time to get out for the grid. Exit the matrix pronto. Throw some cilantro. Detox and alkalize. Stop using floral. And the video is great. It's got some cool dudes rotivating and digging up carrots and all sorts of stuff in the video. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is I'll be telling some of the old folk that live nearby as they water their tomatoes that they are now, in fact, gangster motherfuckers. I'm sure they'll be pleased. The frog did blow. Right, um, so I've got Mark in. Hi, Mark. Hello. This is the last time you're going to hear Mark in the same room as me for a while, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, the last studio one. Because where are you going? I'm off to uh, the rest of the world. <laughs> You're off to the rest of the world to discover things. Yeah. Before we move on, though, I should say that um, Mark's a filmmaker and you had your film launch in August, didn't you, when I went to see it, and it was absolutely amazing, and it's called... It's called A Dirty Weekend. I think it was on, I talked about it a few episodes back. Uh, so uh, a British farce comedy. Yeah, farce comedy, very good. Sort of dark yeah. comedy, wasn't it? Yeah, yes. dark comedy. Some very, very interesting characters in there. Um, and it's on IMDb if you want to have a look at the reviews. And what's the people going to be able to get hold of it soon? It's, it's going to be downloadable. Yeah, or... It's on IMDb, so you can check out all the information to do with the film. But it's then going to be on Amazon within the next few weeks So. By the end of September, it'll be available to buy and rent on Amazon yep. UK and US. Brilliant. So support British independent filmmaking. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's yeah. a, ne I've never done a <laughs> naked shameless plug before. <laughs> that sounds a bit kinky, yeah. but there you go. Um, right. So you're going around the world and you've got a thing itinerary there because you've got some really interesting things planned, haven't you? Do you want to say I have, something? yeah. So now that I've kind of finished this film, I'm, I'm not getting any time in the UK to really write my next one. And I've been that engrossed in filmmaking for the last three years um, that I've, I've, I can now be myself again so I'm going off to Thailand to start with the idea is that I'm going to use the downtime that I get to kind of script my next sort of feature film and do some online promotions of the one that I've just finished but while I'm out there I'm going to be doing some kind of environment conservation work and seeing the world and wow have you any idea what like, yet or are you just going to go and see what, what it's like when you're out there a little bit see what I'm like but my first month I've got a bit of a, a, a plan so I've gone through SDA travel and they've they, they've done as a, what they call and volunteering so oh right cool it's a tour slash volunteering so i've got a few nights on party islands and things like that but i've got a i'm doing a, a four or five day um, renovation project just outside surin oh and right then i go to the elephant village oh, just outside wow. surin that I sounds know. great so are they rescue well are they sort of they are rescued elephants yeah it was a uh, with a going sda travel they check that all the kind of the elephants and things aren't Cruel. Because there's not, some yeah. real dodgy stuff goes on, isn't there, with tourist elephants? Yeah, there is. Stuff. The ones that you ride are generally they're kind of badly trekked and yeah. conditioned and forced to do things. These are the elephants that have been rescued from either tourist trade or logging industry. Yes, because I've so. talked about logging before because quite often it sends them blind because they're meant to have to walk through the forest and they get their eyes poked out, which is quite one of the reasons why yeah. you get quite a lot of blind elephants. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, that, that's that's the plan for the first month. Then there's a few party islands, and after that, I go to Australia. Party islands? Are they what they yeah. sound like? Yeah, they are. Exactly <laughs> what they sound like. Yeah. Well, that's allowed. Yeah. And then you're going to go to Australia. And what's the plan there? Australia. I have also got an itinerary there, but I've I'm not really looking at that until I've been around right. Thailand. So, you just, yeah. so I don't want to be looking forward to Australia. No, no, of, don't waste yeah. Thailand. Don't waste Thailand. No, so Mark's doing these going around the world, doing a, um, being an ordinary person, doing goody co things. Yes. Aren't you? Yeah. And we're going to. Um, He's going to communicate. We're not sure how we're going to do it yet, are we? Whether we're going to try... Yeah, we might try and work out some sort of well, Some face sort of interview, thing. face yeah, something. Yeah. But if that doesn't work, you might do your roving reporter. Yeah, I'll do my own little reports and things. Yeah. I, was just, I was just thinking earlier, if we were doing FaceTime things, it's going to be like three o'clock in the morning when it's a normal time for you. So I might, yeah, maybe I not. might not work. No, uh, no, no, but no. you'll have to brush up your reporting skills. But that'd be really good, especially yeah. the first thing with the elephants. I'd love you. I'd love to um, sort of hear how it's going and what you're doing and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, that'd be really good. I'm sure I'll find out lots of stories, but... Other than that, because I'm not gone yet. No, I know. no, brilliant. Well, all the information um, is to come. All the information is to come. Well, you're leaving pretty soon, aren't you? Yeah, third of October. So it's uh, what date is it now? It's the end of August at the minute, twenty seventh right. of August. So third of the month, and you've got you're leaving work though, aren't you? You're leaving your job soon. Um, yes, I'm leaving my job in education to go off and to do this right well so yeah. good luck and um, yeah we will be hearing from you regularly won't we yes you will maybe not on Party Island but no, maybe right, actually might we might do. learn some stuff there right yeah. brilliant thank you for coming in once cool. again Mark thank you 
Right, well, um, that's all I've got time for. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you from Mark for coming in and enjoy your trip, Mark, and we'll be in touch um, during your, the, the, your trip. Thank you for Len once again for coming in. But most of all, thank you, um, dear listeners, for um, being loyal listeners. And remember, you can go back and listen to the Orchids Are Bastards episode. It is now available. So I will see you soon then. Bye. Big blog.